Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, I want to talk about the vessel, the body, this thing that holds our consciousness, this thing that holds our soul, depending on what bubble you live in, depending on your vocabulary, you know that you are a person, a thing, an entity, a thing. You are a thing. You are a Brittany or a John or a Susan or a Billy or a Ahmed. You are somebody somewhere with an understanding of who you are in your mind. I've been holding on to this idea for months and months and months and months. My partner, months and months and months ago, told me about a song by India Ari and Akon. And the song is called I Am Not My Hair. And there's a line in the song. I have it here right now. I'm going to read it to you. It says, I am not my hair. I am not this skin. I am the soul that lives within. And so I reached out to my hairstylist. I reached out to my homies. I reached out to people. And I was like, what? is your relationship with your hair. And I've been holding on to this idea and I didn't know how to talk about it today, but I've been really thinking about this thing that is a Britney, this thing that you interact with or that you watch on the internet and what makes me me. Now, of course, I've talked about this throughout the year so many times. I remember specifically making a video about how my hair is political. Everything we do, is a means to communicate our intention. Recently, I got an undercut. And I said in a live show, my haircut is political. And some people were like, what do you mean by political? Other people have asked me, why do you have to look so queer? Why can't gay people be individuals? How is my haircut political? In a regular cis society, a vanilla society, where heterosexuality is the focus, often we have women who fit roles of femininity and men who fit roles of masculinity in order to attract one another. This has changed over time and fashion statements have come to rebel against the status quo. I myself have an undercut to signify the queerness that I'm sending out as a, as a signal. It's like a queer signal. It's like a bat queer signal. Fellow queers, do you see my hair? I'm, I am a queer. Come talk to me. I am your people. And it's a very different fashion statement. I have a human in my life that's straight and she is an undercut. But when you look at her, you know she's not making a queer statement. And this is because she's not. But for me, I am making a statement and therefore appear to be queer as a way to send out a signal and as a way to avoid straight men hitting on me. I've kept my long hair because I do love to look femme as well. And I love the idea of being able to put it down and fit all modes of fashion, right? But this was done with an intent. I am on purpose trying to get straight men to stop hitting on me how my hair signals to people, specifically men, that they shouldn't date me. At the time, I had a undercut and I had a very like gay look. And I was specifically trying to signal to women that I was available and signal to men that I was not. Now, as you guys know, I married a man. That happened. Yep, that's, that's the thing that happened. And I married a man who is you know, in love with me as a consciousness, but also like does find my curly hair attractive, does like my facial features, does like that I'm a Syrian, does it mind that sometimes the internet questions like whether or not I'm a woman or not, right? For us, we're aware that we have this vessel, this vessel that holds this consciousness that it is Brittany. But I, I'm having like a new relationship with it now, especially about my hair. What is this thing that I've been so careful about preserving what is this thing that I stopped dying? Because my hairstylist told me, you know, let's get that inflammation down because of the fibro, because I was losing my hair for the last year, because I was having problems with regrowth. What is this hair that, or this hair, what is this thing called my hair that I am so worried about losing? And what I had, what had I done in the past to kind of prepare me for this moment unknowingly? In my past, when I was in my early 20s, I shaved my head multiple times. I got rid of all my hair. And at the time, it was to prove to myself that I felt like a woman, even bald. And now I'm sort of pre-preparing myself to lose this thing that I put so much effort and love into. The products I buy, the time I spent on it, the way I love her, the way I <laughs> just pay attention to this thing that just grows and dies on my head. And then if I lost her, of course, I'd have a different relationship with her. But why does it matter so much? Why does it matter, this thing that I call hair, this thing that I spend so much, just so much time giving attention to it? So like most people who grew up with curly hair, I obviously spent my childhood questioning my beauty, my 
right to feel like I belong. And of course, growing up in Orange County, California with immigrant Assyrian parents and family and relatives who had curly hair but straightened it, had big noses but got them fixed. Growing up as a kid who genuinely wasn't sure she wanted those things, but man, I really dreamt about it. I really fantasized about it. I fantasized so hard about where I belonged and how much of my image I had to change to belong that I eventually, I think, kind of won the lottery by never needing to change it. I went from crying, crying, because my mom would let me chemically straighten my hair, straighten my hair, to never straightening my hair again, right? I finally reached my mid to late 20s, and I was like, you know what? I'm going natural. This is it. In my mid-20s, I basically gave up on the idea of ever getting no surgery. I basically decided I was going to embrace this vessel, and a big part of the reason why was because of that introspective journey. Look, introspection, we're looking within. Extrospection, we're looking, you know, outside of ourselves. Existing ourselves, existence, everybody else, right? Existence was telling me I wasn't good enough. Some parts of existence were telling me I was perfect the way I was. Ooh, but can you change the fact that you're gay, right? So the same bubbles that were like, hey, change your nose, change your hair. We love that you're gay. The opposite bubbles were like, we hate that you're gay, but also like you're beautiful the way you are. Don't change your nose. Don't change your hair. So it was like kind of confusing. How many parts of Britney was I allowed to be in order for existence to accept me? And as a content creator who's always aware that she isn't exactly embraced by the masses, I know that I'm niche. And I like being niche because it means I get to hang out with an audience that's niche and I get to meet really cool people that have similar journeys to me. My relationship with my hair, um, well, as many <laughs> girls with a wavier curly hair do, it started with wishing that my hair was straight. Uh, but I have always valued being natural over aesthetics, so I never really straightened it, never really did much to my hair, never even really dyed it. Um, and my hair has always kind of been like this, but my feelings towards my hair have changed. Um, I do now appreciate the texture and the volume that I can achieve. For a second there, I tried to prioritize um, definition in my waves, but now I just wash, condition, and then brush my hair out. Um, it suits my style. I try to dress a little bit of a retro kind of um, 80s, 70s style, basically like my mom did in college. Um, and I think that just kind of suits me and my essence um, and my overall aesthetic, which is usually less is more. Um, and just trying to be decorated but not altered, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's it. Bye. So in regards to whether I'll have like a really tight relationship with my hair, it is extremely sacred to me because I spent most of my life hating my hair, primarily because there wasn't a lot of information on how to take care of black hair, especially with my mom being white. Despite her having some experience with, you know, black women teaching her how to do black hair, wasn't enough, and we had a lot of problems. So once I became an adult and I started locking my hair, my relationship with it changed completely. And now I understand why, like indigenous cultures especially, consider the hair so sacred, because it really fucking is. And I'm kind of glad that like natural is normalized much more than it ever was to the point that you can actually be like proud of your hair. And with that, I think it's helped me on my journey towards self-love. And so for that, very sacred. I know that when you go on an introspective journey, you're kind of telling yourself, who am I outside of my community? And without a community, you are just a person. And so you're kind of lonely. Once I decided to embrace my curly hair, once I decided to embrace this thing that was natural, I went on YouTube, looked up natural curly hair, and of course it was black women who were teaching me how to do my hair. And I really appreciate that because again, their community came together to foster this shared education, which I benefited from, which I really appreciate, right? And I look at that and I think without that community, what would they have had? But within the community, there's also a hierarchy of beauty. There's also a hierarchy of who has good hair. There's also a hierarchy of feeling ostracized. And so then I have to go back to those words, right? I have to go back to those words from uh, India Ari and ask myself, 
am I more than just my hair? Am I more than my skin? Am I more than this vessel, this body that carries my consciousness? Obviously, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, because that is what I think. I think that's the capital T truth that is too hard to process sometimes. Because our existing and existence meshes together and creates chaos, it is hard to admit out loud like, hey, I don't think that these things could matter. But of course they matter because other people make them an issue. And so you build communities out of surviving and you build communities out of feeling ostracized. Like, that's great. But see how we're building a community off something negative? And so I had to question myself even now, why do I cling to communities that are built off of minority suffrage? It's because I feel seen. It's because the part of me that has to interact with existence is seen through those bubbles as a queer person, as an Assyrian, as someone with curly hair, someone with a big nose, as somebody who's not conventional. Those suffering communities bring a lot of joy because we can understand each other's suffering. But that thing that's past that, when you go through that introspective, extrospective journey and you realize like, oh, these are all constructs and we're creating them and then we keep them going because what else are we supposed to do? That can feel like another version of alienation. To be honest with you, when I'm at home and I'm in my little bubble here and I like it here, it's like a safe space. My hair doesn't matter. My nose doesn't matter. My skin doesn't matter. My background doesn't matter. I'm just like a Britney. But also, I'm all of those things at once. I'm all of the Britneys at once. So of course they have to matter because they informed my consciousness, the person that I am here in front of you. So the irony, right, is that our suffering can't escape us and life is suffering because life is hard. Our past can't escape us because it helped build the foundation for this person that you are now. And at the same time, if the realist answer of existing is that none of these things matter, it's interesting how much on the micro we have to come back to them mattering. So on the macro, of course, they don't matter. The universe doesn't care what your skin color is or like what your hair texture is. But the micro does. The funniest part of living in a world where conservatives hate trans people for just existing is that they're always admitting how much they care what you're doing with your life. They care so much. And then you have to care. What is my gender? What is my outlook? What is my relationship with my body? And then you have to care. Because they care. I wonder what it would have been like to live in a world where it didn't matter, where it could just be a thing we did for fun. But then, of course, humans are all about that competition. So, you know, at the end of the day, we'd create a hierarchy of mean girls and nice girls and acceptable hair and non-acceptable hair, which is why even in our minority co like communities, we still create that hierarchy of who's better. This conversation came about because I was questioning once again my relationship with the parts of myself that existed before and that mattered so much, like what I looked like, and the version of me now who cares what I look like, but now I'm more focused on like getting muscles and getting stronger and how that also is going to come with its own baggage from existence. Oh, you look too manly. Look, she has muscles. Oh my gosh, she's looking more like a man every day. Like I know that's going to be part of it. And it's like you can't ever escape it when you're dealing with other people. But then the question is, do we ever escape it within ourselves when we hold this past version of us within ourselves? And those are the ideas around this that I've really been thinking about, right? When I first heard Solange's Don't Touch My Hair, of course I had to ask myself, is this for me? Is this song for me? Now, whether or not Solange had me in mind, probably not, she had a way of singing about it, talking about it, the music video, the way they physically, visually conveyed it, hit me. It made me feel seen. Now again, I'm just the kind of person who consumes all content and assumes some part of it is for me because I think human beings, like I am you and you are me, and I think that human beings universally experience things that we can exchange information about so we both understand each other if there's enough similar energies going on okay so Solange made the song and it hit me and it made me feel really seen and I remember just like blaring it all the time loving the video but it did beg the question was this made for me which means that I might once again have something that's not made for me which I once again have nothing <laughs> you know what I mean and this is me being young and being confused about my identity and not figuring out 
exactly how to be a single consciousness separate from this physical vessel that I inhabit, right? Very woo-woo language, but at the end of the day, if we were all blind, would it really matter? So I had to then ask myself through this journey of hair, 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 through this journey of hair, who is Brittany? And how do I figure that out? Well, a part of the rejection from the girls with straight blonde hair and a part of the rejection from, of course, black content creators who wanted a space for themselves and me not fitting in both groups actually did offer me an opportunity to get to know myself in a very introspective way. To be honest with you, once again, rejection, my favorite thing in the whole world, led me down a path to understand myself in a much better way. Why was I being rejected? by everyone around me. Now, it wasn't literal, right? Black women have embraced me. They've been my friends. My hairstylist is black. My friends are black. Like, it's not that. And it's not that my white friends, like one of my besties is white and blonde hair. Like, it's not that they rejected me literally. It's not like they said, Brittany, no. But the messaging, the signaling is I know, because I'm not ridiculous, that I am neither white, white, (laughs) like American white, like English, European, UK white, nor am I black. I know that. I know that my vessel is just a little bit different. So even though these communities tried to embrace me in different ways, I never quite felt like home. And then my Middle Eastern, you know, brethren, y'all, we okay, we've been straightening our hair and fixing our noses for so long. I don't even know if we know we're Middle Eastern. The fact that one of the off, like often one of the questions I get from people is like, oh, you didn't decide to do your nose. Look, do your nose. Get plastic surgery. Do whatever it takes to feel beautiful. But I needed to go down a journey that was different. It's not any better, to be honest with you. Sometimes I I wish I could have been a person that maybe went down that road, but it just doesn't seem to facilitate my joy. And so I will miss out on things that you will have. And in turn, I think the journey that I'm going to go down, have gone down, is a little bit different. It's about having a relationship outside of how I look and where I've come from and asking myself, is there like a soul or a consciousness that is Brittany that is even separate from the name that was given to me, right? Because that's not a name I chose. I was given that name. It's a great name, but I was given it. Is there a version of me that exists outside of my hair, outside of my skin, outside of this body, outside of my communities? Is there a version of me? And is that okay? Now, in order to do this, I had to go on a journey of rejecting the fact that I could be be myself in a community because it didn't seem to be true. Every time I'm around people, I censor myself. I think this is reasonable. You want to have good manners. But I also think a big part of it is like just you, it's just like really anxiety inducing. I mean, I feel anxious making this podcast, if I'm being honest. I don't know if you can tell, but I am anxious making it because it's going to sound like I'm putting blame on my communities and I'm not doing that. I'm just letting you all know that some of us aren't ever going to fit even into the most minority community. We're going to ask ourselves, well, who are we outside of these communities? And some of you are going to thrive in your communities because you're community built, which I love. But for a person like me, it's more like I'm going to visit and bring out that version of me that coincides with the community the best. And then I'm going to huddle back into my bubble and I'm going to be the version of me that's just like the most honest and raw. Now, again, when we're in community settings, we're not always meant to be as raw But there is an illusion that gets conveyed, an illusion that gets promoted, that in the right community, you can be your true and honest and authentic self. I'm not sure once you get more than two, three, four, five people together, that there isn't going to be a lot of chaos because of just the small nuanced deviations in ideals. So again, this led me down the journey of asking myself, who is Brittany when the whole world is silent? Who is Brittany when she's on an island? The consciousness that is Brittany now, this person, if I took myself and put myself on an island, would I care about my hair? Would I care about my skin? Would I care about my body? And the answer isn't as black and white as I thought it would be. It's actually just as confusing as the rest of this podcast has been. It's not easy to know because I hold all of my past thoughts and all of my past traumas and all of my past knowing. It's not always so black and white of like, of course I wouldn't care. I don't know. Being on an island brings out different versions of what I want in myself. Being in a different physical setting brings out a different version of what I want for myself. It's just less and less and less and less about other people. 
And it's more about maybe being efficient in how I utilize the tools of my body, like getting stronger. But here I am imagining myself on this island without a community and without their voices telling me how I should look and how I should want to look and how I should want to feel about myself. So I want to run you through how I figured this out. How did I figure out how to be okay with who I was as a consciousness? Well, a big part of it came with experimentation. Who was I in relation to how I dressed, in relation to how I kept my hair, in relation to how I presented, in the way that I confidently held myself when I tried things that a lot of people were hesitant to allow me to try. I remember every time I wear a headscarf, like every time I, hair, I wear one, some white lady is in my comments talking about how I can't wear a headscarf and someone has to go and correct her and say, oh no, no, Brittany's a part of this bubble called Middle Eastern and Assyrian in Iraq and she's allowed to wear this piece of cloth on her head. And yes, that is true. If I'm playing the game of the bubbles, I'm playing the politics of the bubbles. I'm playing what is allowed by which group. I get a lot of perks and I get a lot of like little things that I get to do that other people can't do. And at the same time, how silly is that, right? We're living on a planet. We don't know why we're here. There's this construct that exists in front of us about who can wear a cloth and who can't wear a cloth. And yeah, I understand certain religious communities, um, certain indigenous communities, certain communities really, really hold sacred their hair and their cloth. And I want to allow them to live in that universe where they get to explore those things. But again, why do we explore those things? Do we have factual knowledge about why we're exploring those things? Do we believe in God? Do we believe in magic? Do we believe in our ancestors holding some sort of sacred spiritual energy in relation to the traditions they've passed down? Do we believe that we come from some line of very important people? When I'm placed on an island all by myself, when I tell myself, think about this thought experiment, I've placed you on an island all by yourself. Is there sacredness? Is there magic? Who am I? Well, I'm a human who needs to eat and needs shelter, so I go for the basics. And then because I hold tradition in my memories, maybe I'll wrap my hair, which by the way, with my people, wasn't a tradition of anything more than dressing up nicely slash avoiding the sun. And it was a very specific look. You know, even the headscarves that I wear are a sort of modern view of what my aunties would wear because they wore more of a circular hat. It was like a cloth and you would wrap it in a way that was like, it sits on your head kind of more like a hat. And so even then I'm kind of playing with a modern twist on something that I sort of come from. I'm a USA American born girl. I was never, I've never even been to Iraq. So in some ways, maybe I have no right to wear the headscarf. But in other ways, once again, where does this construct come from where like some people can wear it and some people can't? Where does the construct come from? I think it comes from tradition, which is beautiful. Tradition, which I also think holds destruction because tradition is also something that anti-LGBT people use all the time for their reasoning of why LGBT people can't have rights. I think tradition is something that's beautiful because it holds so many amazing memories. But for a lot of us, tradition is the reason we have mental health problems. Tradition is the reason we're sick. So the irony, of course, is that there is a spiritual element to this. I just think it has more to do with the individual than the community. I think the community can make you feel seen in moments, but the community doesn't exist on the island with you when you're meditating about your, about your consciousness. So if you're sitting on the island and you're meditating about your consciousness, there really is no construct about your hair or about your body that doesn't come from you. You can pull from your ancestors, but then the question is, do my ancestors own my consciousness? And I don't think they do. I love my ancestors. They did a lot for me to be this Britney. They also did a lot to try to stop me from being this Britney, <laughs> depending on, you know, how you look at it. But I really think if you're on that island and you ask yourself, why do I dress my vessel the way I do? Often it might be this don't let me project onto you. It might just be for comfort. Beauty could be about comfort. Earlier I said I'm not really interested in pretty right now. When I'm alone, I'm interested in pe pretty when I'm performing. But to be honest, I, it, beauty is I think more what I'm interested in. And beauty 
can happen with or without an audience. I don't think beauty has to perform. I think sexiness and prettiness performs. I think beauty is within the consciousness and the spirit of the environment. So you can hold beauty in your vessel when you're alone and you can perform prettiness and sexiness when you have an audience, even if the audience is just yourself. But I think if I'm alone on that island and I'm thinking about my consciousness and I'm thinking about that Brittany, I'm just thinking about being peaceful and content and finding the beauty in being alive. The beauty in this thing that I call a body, beauty in this thing that I know as hair, beauty in this thing that I know as woman, beauty in this thing that I know as alive. I'm looking for beauty. That relationship I had with myself was really hard because it meant sort of not caring about the fact that I was queer or a Syrian or a woman. Now, I don't want the wrong bubbles hearing this and being like, see, it doesn't even matter if you're gay. No, shush, not you. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people that are understanding that we're having different relationships with our consciousness and the version of us that interacts with the world. It does matter that you're gay. It does matter that you're black. It does matter that your hair is sacred. It does matter that you're trans. It does matter that you're a woman. It does matter all these things. It does matter. In a certain context, within a certain construct. But I just want to make a video to remind people that they don't always have to be within those constructs. They can have conversations with themselves, experiences with themselves, don't always exist within that construct. They can exist in a different one, a more peaceful one that isn't about other people, that is about yourself and the beautiful relationship you can have with yourself. Because no matter how many ways I say this, I just know it's going to reach the wrong audience or the wrong people. I just have so much anxiety in my head about the wrong group seeing this and being like, see, Brittany is saying like, Minorities are silly for expressing their, like, love for hair. No, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, my God. Like, I just, I hate the, the, those bubbles really upset me. Like, I just, ooh, because they're so shallow in their thinking that they forget that they them, themselves hold things sacred. They just don't want to admit it. And they want to be able to hold things sacred that they don't want other people to hold sacred, like hair. So I'm just saying, hold things sacred that you want to hold sacred. But most of all, you should hold sacred the relationship you have with yourself, your consciousness. The world cannot be the end-all be-all for you unless you want to sacrifice yourself for it. And that is a game I'm not playing anymore. I'm not sacrificing myself for my community or the world around me. I don't play that game anymore. You know what I mean? So I think I could only get here when I realized that sacrificing myself for my community was the reason my soul was dying. My consciousness wasn't healthy and I wasn't happy. But that, again, is a journey in and of itself. I'm not judging your journey. I'm just letting you know you can have a different one. And all of this stemmed from my relationship with this thing we call hair. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you for putting up with my anxiety because honestly, girl, I feel it right now. I just don't want to, I don't want to be misunderstood. But also like, how important is the construct? You know? All right, talk to you guys soon. Have a great day. Let me know what you guys think in the comment sections down below and check out um, the links from the beautiful voices that ended up in this video today. I really appreciate all my friends um, joining me for this collaboration. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. In my head, in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool.